Washington. If we are uncomfortable with the prospect of mass genetic data collection of people um, who are suspected of no crime, um, then we need to ask ourselves, what's the next place that this will be deployed? Welcome to the Washington Tech Tech Policy Podcast. The latest tech law and policy news and brightest tech law and policy experts wherever you are. So you can stay informed on the move in less time. From Washington, D.C., it's the Washington Tech Tech Policy Podcast. With Joe Miller. Joe Miller. Mark Zuckerberg defends his decision to allow misinformation by politicians. Is the Facebook CEO qualified to make the right calls when it comes to free speech? Not everyone thinks so. Also, Elizabeth Warren announces her plan to reject big tech donations. And Andrew Free is my guest. Hey, everybody. Mark Zuckerberg delivered remarks on Thursday at Georgetown University defending his company's policy to leave up false political ads. But his speech was roundly criticized. Both Democrats and civil rights organizations blasted Zuckerberg for deliberately refusing to fact check ads placed by politicians. Leadership Conference for Civil Rights President Vanita Gupta, NAACP Legal Defense Fund head Sherilyn Eiffel and Bernice King, the daughter of slain civil rights icon Martin Luther King Jr., along with Al Sharpton and others, all pointed to the historical role that disinformation has played in suppressing the voices of and inciting hatred against people of color. Elizabeth Warren also escalated her attacks against Zuckerberg, challenging Facebook to remove an ad that her campaign posted. In order to illustrate the absurdity of Facebook's policy to leave up false ads placed by politicians, Warren's ad contained a deliberately false claim that Zuckerberg had endorsed Donald Trump for president. Facebook responded that it would prioritize free speech over facts and that it wouldn't step in to police false claims made by politicians. And Joe Biden's presidential campaign sent a letter to Facebook after a political action committee posted an ad that falsely claimed that Biden blackmailed the Ukrainian government to stop investigating his son, Hunter Biden, by threatening to withhold aid. Biden's campaign says the ad wasn't posted by a politician. It was posted by a PAC and shouldn't have been taken down. The ad has since been removed. And on Monday, Facebook announced that it found and disabled misinformation campaigns apparently being conducted by Russia and Iran. The company also announced plans to label content posted by state actors. In a blog post ahead of Tuesday's Democratic debate, Elizabeth Warren also pledged to reject campaign funding from executives at Alphabet, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Lyft, and other big tech companies. Those executives would otherwise be allowed to donate up to $2,800 apiece. And during the Democratic debate Tuesday night, Kamala Harris went after Elizabeth Warren for the latter's refusal to support Harris's call for Twitter to disable Trump's Twitter account. Warren responded that her goal is to get Trump out of the White House, not off Twitter. Twitter has said that it would not disable Trump's account unless he specifically violates the social media company's rules against threatening individuals, promoting terrorism or self-harm, or posting information, private information, like a phone number. Bernie Sanders, on the other hand, has his crosshairs on big media. The presidential candidate released a plan to dismantle the mergers of large media companies that have been approved during the Trump era. Sanders specifically mentioned Disney's acquisition of 21st Century Fox as an example of corporate greed that he would seek to tamp down as president. Facebook has lost the support of major payment platforms it relied on to make its cryptocurrency Libra a reality. MasterCard, Visa, eBay, Stripe, and Latin American payments company Mercado Pago all pulled out of the partnership with the so-called Libra Association, citing regulatory concerns and a number of other factors. The companies joined PayPal, which left the association the week before last, but Lyft and Vodafone are still in, according to Reuters. The Federal Communications Commission voted along party lines to approve the Sprint T-Mobile merger last week, with Democratic Commissioners Jessica Rosenworcel and Jeffrey Starks opposing based on pricing concerns, including the lack of a resolution regarding the broadband subsidy program known as Lifeline. The deal got the DOJ's stamp of approval in July, but the merger still faces a multi-state lawsuit from 10 states looking to block the merger. Finally, AT&T has continued to hike prices by as much as 50%, according to John Brodkin at Ars. The company's new TV Now package is rising by $15 per month from $50 to $65. 
The company is also raising prices on its Live a Little plan from $50 to $60 in November, and this is the second time the company has raised prices for the plan. In April, it hiked it from $40 to $50. That's a $20 monthly increase over the span of just seven months. And you can find links to all these stories in the show notes and also in our Twitter feed. And our handle is at Washington Tech. Stay with us. Tech policy is global policy. This is the Washington Tech. Tech policy podcast. The My guest today is Andrew Free. He's an abolitionist lawyer fighting alongside immigrant communities in the deep south and across the country to defend deportations and advance civil rights. Please welcome Andrew Free. Andrew, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Joe. It's good to be here. So senior officials in the Trump administration announced recently their plan for a joint effort by both the Departments of Homeland Security and Justice Department to begin collecting DNA evidence from thousands of migrants, now numbering in excess of 40,000 who've been detained at the southern border with Mexico. So I'll turn it to you, Andrew. What's going on here? What appears to be happening is that the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Justice want to add, for the first time, uh, people People who have come into the custody of Border Patrol or Customs and Border Protection, which are two DHS or Department of Homeland Security agency components operating on the southern border. And it seems that what they want to do is deploy uh, what's called rapid DNA scan technology to take samples uh, from everyone who is coming into contact with law enforcement officers at the southern border of the United States. Um, Obviously, we need to learn more. Uh, there's been a release of some information um, from the government in, in the form of a privacy impact assessment that happened on June 25th of 2019 for rapid DNA operational use. Uh, but the details and the contours of the program, who will be included and excluded, are still unclear. And so what's the legal basis that the federal government's asserting here? Rapid DNA testing and, and really the collection of DNA evidence started with, a, as I understand it, a program that was initiated by then Attorney General Janet Rito to try and include increase the numbers of samples uh, available to people who had come into contact with the federal criminal justice system. Those are people who may have been prosecuted um, by the FBI, the DEA, um, or other federal law enforcement agencies in in criminal court um, in the federal judicial system. And then to put that DNA uh, database, I believe it's called CODIS, um, I'm sure I'll be um, able to correct myself if I'm wrong enough couple of minutes as I get into some of the broader discussion. So they want to put all the DNA samples into a database that can then be checked um, by um, participants, uh, other government agencies, um, for matches or for hits. And because of the nature of DNA, it is thought that that would establish the identity of the person associated with that DNA record. Or what the federal government is trying to do now is to bring in DHS, um, or at least part of DHS's activities, into the DOJ's database. So what are the differences between the way the U.S. collects DNA currently and the way it seeks to do so now? As I understand it, the big change here is that people who are going to come into contact with immigration officials at the southern border uh, and who are not being charged with a crime, that is, um, they're not going to be charged with illegal entry or criminal re-entry. Instead, these are civil violations, if they're violations at all. As um, we've tried to emphasize, it's not a crime to come to a port of entry and seek a asylum or to seek admission based on a legally protected ground. Um, And yet those people who at best are going to be in civil enforcement proceedings for deportation uh, are then going to have their their genetic material taken and warehoused and then spread and shared both warehoused by the United States government and then spread uh, to unknown partners at this point um, for purposes that we're, we're not really clear on. And what happens if border officials collect DNA evidence from a detainee who later turns out to be an American citizen? 
I think you've hit the nail on the head here. I think that's a, a key concern. Uh, in my practice and in the day-to-day -day life of enforcement at the border, um, I've run across uh, numerous people who've been caught up in border enforcement, in checkpoints, and in immigration um, detention, even deportation of United States citizens. Uh, there is no guarantee that people who are found to be United States citizens will then um, have their DNA expunged. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is it is not just going to be DNA. There will be an associated record with that genetic material, because in order to put it into a database and have it mean anything, you have to have the record associated with a person. And so the short answer to your question is we don't know. And this could be um, a window, um, an opening for the federal government and law enforcement to collect vast swaths of biological and gen genetic information on U.S. citizens um, with no probable cause or reasonable suspicion uh, and no oversight by any court. It's pretty eerie that we're having this conversation. It really is, particularly when we start thinking about the implications of it. And so what are immigration advocates? I know you went into some detail about it, but what are immigration advocates saying about this? What I've heard my colleagues say is that this is a Pandora's box. We are unclear as to how this information will be used presently and in the future. Um, but what we do know is that the agencies who have responsibility for collecting, maintaining, organizing, and storing this information have a really poor track record of being accountable and having accurate databases. And so what we see as advocates all the time are name mess ups or fingerprint identification mess ups within immigration enforcement databases. I've had individuals who've been denied the opportunity to post bond and secure their freedom based on false records that were associated with them in ICE's system. Similarly, I've seen CBP officials records um, coming back with hits for people who actually were not the subject of that enforcement action. And so there's the not uh, there, there's the um, perennially present danger of user error. There's also the fact that oftentimes you're not actually getting a full DNA sequence with these rapid scans. The ones they, they deployed earlier this summer uh, to determine whether people were in family units or whether they were in so-called fake families, um, which is a derogatory term in my opinion, um, those are not going to give a full DNA sequence. Instead, they're going to give um, a, a shorter sequence that'll be used to build a DNA profile. And that increases the likelihood of false hits um, and there's significant user error going on. Um, again, we see user error uh, all the time with Border Patrol and CBP in other areas of their activities when it comes to civil rights, when it comes to the care and safety of people in their custody, and when it comes to ensuring that their activities uh, fall within their statutory and regulatory authority. There is no reason, based on the track record of these agencies, to believe that this will be done in any sort of um, more efficacious way. The training alone that it would take to get this done is something that would significantly divert from the core missions of these agencies. So that's the present concern. I think the future term concern is much more um, Orwellian and, and dark. Um, obviously, with people's DNA, you're not just able to find out uh, information about a person, their predisposition to certain diseases. Um, there are certain DNA um, scholars that think that you can actually, and I don't understand the medicine well enough, but there are certain DNA scholars that think you can actually understand whether a person is going to be predisposed to certain types of crime. Um, and that would be truly terrifying if we have um, an entire population Keep in mind, it's only the southern border, not the Canadian border, not the airports. An entire population who will now be at risk for becoming a false hit in the next closed case, uh, you know, murder or unsolved rape. Um, and you've essentially said that because you've come to the southern border uh, and presented yourself or been apprehended, um, now you are going to be at risk for that. And ultimately, I worry most about this data falling into the wrong hands. We know that there have been significant data breaches of personally identifiable information within government databases, often because of contractors and their absence of 
um, meaningful security mechanisms. I really do worry about a country like China um, or or others uh, getting their hands on genetic information that could say determine whether you've got all of the you know biological material matching a Uyghur, for instance, or. Unfortunately, um, as you see some of the, the, the recent crackdowns on ethnic minorities, to the extent that those ethnic minorities are not simply um, human constructs and they are genetic, I would worry about other governments with whom we have information sharing agreements in our law enforcement databases using or misusing this information. And so for me, it's um, it's pretty terrifying. Thanks so much for joining me, Andrew. Thanks for having me, Joe. Uh, normally we do an icebreaker, but this issue feels too serious <laughs> to uh to lighten things up. Um, so we'll just jump, we'll just jump past the uh, icebreaker and we'll do your career advice and, uh, and find out what you're reading and what we should be reading um, as we learn more about this issue. Stay with us. What's the best piece of career advice you've ever received? This is for all of the aspiring civil rights lawyers out there. Read the footnotes. Uh, you know, that's not really a piece of career advice. It's really a practice pointer. But I think that the attention to detail that happens when you're um, immersed in what people are using uh, to justify their um, their arguments and also you're digging into what they're hiding Um it comes with a certain attitude about the way that we approach our craft. And so if you are planning on going into civil rights or human rights law um, and you're not reading footnotes, you're not the sort of person who has got the orientation to really pick through all of the details so that you understand how people have come to conclusions, um, a new world opens up when you start doing that. Um, so I, I think uh, I think read the footnotes. What would you recommend in terms of content? What should we be reading and, and watching and, and listening to to find out more and be conversant about this issue that's sure. happening with DNA? Well, so I'm, yeah, um, in terms of DNA, you know, I've, I've been digging recently since there was this briefing into um, the Electronic uh, Frontier Foundation's um, scholarship on this. It's, it's happened over the course of several years. Uh, and they've done a practice pointer about Maryland versus King, which is the Supreme Court decision um, that held that essentially a suspicionless collection of DNA samples uh, does not violate the Fourth Amendment. Um, I would particularly point folks to Justice Scalia's dissent um, in Maryland versus King. A lot of folks uh, may be surprised to see what Justice Scalia has to say. Uh, I've also been reading uh, People versus Booza, which is the California Court of Appeals um, decision that rejected what the Supreme Court said, um, and State versus Medina, which is a Vermont um, Supreme Court decision um, that similarly uh, thought that you needed to have some sort of probable cause um, in order to take people's DNA. More broadly, I've been really excited um, to read <clears throat> the books of a number of, of, of colleagues that have come out. So Jason DeParle wrote a book called A Good Provider is One Who Leaves, One Family and Migration in the 21st Century. Um, this is a two-time Pulitzer Prize finalist, and I'm really excited to dig into that. Um, I've also been reading The Feather Thief by an author by the name of Kirk Johnson, who's done his share of immigration-based work um, trying to resettle our Iraqi allies uh, into the United States. Mm -hmm. Final thoughts you'd like to leave with us, and where can we find you? So you can find me on Twitter, IMM Civil Rights. Um, you can find me on the web at uh, resist, www.resist.law. I think that we as active participants in the democratic society who value information um, have a responsibility to test the assumptions that are being handed down by these federal agencies, whether that's doing doing so through notice and comment rulemaking, whether it's doing so through just asking other people that you're talking with about this stuff. How would you feel if you got caught up in a checkpoint in, say, New Mexico or Arizona um, within the, the border zone, and then all of a sudden they decided they were going to do a, pin print, a pinprick or a cheek swab? Um, we, as people who are live, living in the interior of the United States or living in Washington, D.C., often um, take these problems and make them very abstract. Uh, but the truth is the border, uh, the border region is typically a testing ground 
for technologies and law enforcement strategies that will eventually find their way into the interior of the United States. You can look no further than commercial drones um, for an example of that. Um, and there are others. Um, if we are uncomfortable with the prospect of mass genetic data collection of people um, who are suspected of no crime, um, then we need to ask ourselves, what's the next place that this will be deployed? And if it is allowed to be deployed here without resistance, it will be deployed in other contexts. You've been listening to immigration and civil rights lawyer, Andrew Free. Andrew, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Joe. And that concludes episode 206 of the podcast. Thanks so much for listening. If you like what we do, we'd love to hear from you. Please take a moment, head over to Apple Podcasts, give it a quick review, honest review. It helps others know what they can expect from the show and really helps us out. Thanks again for listening and I'll see you back here next week. Take care.